people know the most about. Um, I've put up a number of learning objectives for you. Goodness, that's loud. We, the, the idea of these lectures, what I'm hoping to do here is, is to provide a theoretical toolkit for you um, so that if you go to design a, a protein production strategy, um, you, can, you can sit down and design the protein production strategy. Um, and then if something goes wrong in your protein production, um, you can sort of use this theoretical framework to go back and troubleshoot the issue. And the, the, the framework is really based around the, the central dogma of molecular biology, um, which, which you should all know already. So this, this should be building on knowledge that you already have in, in molecular biology. Good. So in terms of, of protein production in bacteria, it's, it's good sort of to be a... a a generalist. Um, it's good if you have a, a little bit of knowledge about everything. We won't be talking about protein purification, where it's really good to have a lot of knowledge about protein biochemistry. We're just talking about protein production. Um, and knowing a little bit about everything can help you to optimize a protein, the production of proteins in your organism of interest. Right? It's good to know some microbiology and some bacteriology just for things like sterile technique or how to work with bacteria, or how to grow bacteria, how to think about even designing growth media. It's good to know some microbial genetics to help you with your clonings or to, to help um, to design your protein production strategy. Um, and also to think about things like how you're actually, how growing something in a bulk culture can influence um, how well your protein gets produced. It's good to know a bit about microbial physiology. We'll run into this briefly, right? There are things like um, a, a process called catabolite uh, repression, where, where you have a preferred number of, of carbon sources, you prefer to glow on glucose, um, and that will shut down production of, of proteins from, or of, yeah, of proteins from promoters that are driving the, that are driven by the expression from other sorts of sugars or carbon sources. Um, it's good to know about protein biochemistry because it's always good to know a little bit of a background about what you're producing and how producing it might affect your final outcome. And then finally, we'll, we'll touch a bit on this. It's good to have a passing knowledge of biophysics. I don't mean to scare any of you with, with biophysics, um, and you don't need to know it in detail, but it's kind of good to have a, a, a sort of um, overview knowledge of it. Good, so what, I think it's worth sort of starting off with your goal for protein production, right? If, if you, you know, start off at the, at the beginning of the process, I guess, you know, you set yourself a goal, and that's usually to make as much protein as possible, um, as quickly, so, so in as short a time, um, and as simply as possible. And, and, and microbes, and in particular bacteria, provide a huge advantage in this regard. Um, bacteria usually have relatively limited nutrient requirements. Um, they, they grow rapidly, so you can produce lots of, of protein um, in a short amount of time. Part of the reason that they grow rapidly is because uh, the, the, at least translation elongation rate, so you know, the rate at which you actually make proteins, is about um, double that of a eukaryotic ribosome. Um, and not only do they grow rapidly, right, not only can you go from one cell to about 10 to the 11th cells in about 15 hours, um, right, so doubling time of E. coli is about 30 minutes or 20 to 30 minutes, they can also grow to really high cell densities, right, so you can get a lot of protein, a lot of cells that are all producing your protein of interest in a very small volume. Um, and not only that, because of the limited nutrient requirements, they tend to be relatively easy to grow. You can take a little bit of, of digested milk um, protein, uh, put it in a, in a tube with some salt um, and, some, and some amino acids from a yeast extract, and, and off E. coli grows like, like nothing else. Um, because it's easy to grow, and, it's, it, and it's, easy to, it's easy to grow in large cultures, you can grow it in huge batch cultures. These are just some fermenters that I took a picture of from the internet. Um, so you can get these, these huge 50, 100 liter, um, and even bigger fermenters. Um, which means you can make even more of your protein. Um, and many bacteria, uh, because they, they are relatively simple organisms, have really well-developed well genetic systems. Right? That, that makes them really easy to manipulate. We, we, we know a lot about how bacteria um, make 
RNA from DNA and from how they and how they make DNA uh, proteins from 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 mRNA, um, and and we can manipulate that to, to, to a greater degree in, in prokaryotes because they're just such such simpler organisms. Um, Finally, they have really, really high cytoplasmic protein levels. I mean, compared to eukaryotes, the, 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 the cytoplasm of, 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 a, of E. coli in particular is just chock-a-block with proteins. There's barely any water there at all, right? So that you can just, and, and because of this, you can just make lots and lots and lots of protein in a relatively short period of time in bacteria. There are some disadvantages, of course, to, to any system. Um, and, and these disadvantages are things that you, you, you may um, need to bear in mind, right? They, they, they might be deal breakers for your protein production strategy. So, for example, um, many eukaryotic proteins simply won't fold correctly in bacteria. That might be because they require some sort of additional, uh, either a molecular chaperone, or they might require some sort of additional processing step or some sort of covalent modification that simply doesn't occur in bacteria. So, for example, bacteria don't, um, form glycosylations. They do acetylate proteins, but they acetylate proteins in a slightly different way. They contain a different suite of proteases and molecular chaperones. Um, and this, this might sort of uh, kill, kill your plans for producing your protein in bacteria. But on the whole, you can, you can often get around these problems. So, so why might you want to get around these problems, right? So, so, so Microorganisms, and again, bacteria, are used pretty frequently in protein production. Um, I, I'm showing you an example of, a, of, of several proteins that, that, that have been made in bacteria. Um, the one at the left is recombinant insulin from Eli Lilly. This really doesn't get made too much anymore um, because they've moved, on, they've moved uh, insulin production to, to eukaryotic systems. But still, uh, and, and particularly for human drugs, people have moved away, or drugs that will eventually get injected into humans, they've moved away mostly from producing um, antibiotics and bacteria. But there are still many examples in industrial uh, settings where you might want to produce a protein in, in bacteria. So for example, um, your, your um, laundry detergents typically contain lots of proteases and lipases. You know, one of the reasons that your, your clothes get dirty is they rub up against your skin. Your skins contain lots of lipids and and proteins, and that tends to be what sticks to your clothes, and they're really hard to get off. So if you can chop them up, they come off better in solution. Um, and, and, and so d detergents typically contain lots of, lots of um, proteins, like, like lipases and proteases. Uh, alternatively, there, there are insecticides, like uh, a Bt toxin. Um, Bt toxin is a natural toxin made by Bacillus thuringiensis, and in fact, what, the, what, what you can see there, yeah, what you can see right here, I hate this room, um, is a Bacillus thuringiensis organism. And what this big black spot is, in, in, is, is a huge crystal of, of Bt toxin. Right? They make so much of it that it crystallizes in, in their cytoplasm. And, and that's an effective insecticide and, and, and a, an insecticide that's typically considered um, bio. Another reason why you might want to use microorganisms, again, like I mentioned, you have lots of, of molecular tools for molecular biology. There are lots of biotech companies selling lots of different tools. Um, these are just a few that I quickly gained off the internet. There's Merck Millipore, New England Biolabs, and Vitrogen. Agilent, Promega, all of these companies will, will gladly send you a catalog outlining all of the tools that they have developed for protein production. Um, and so you, all you have to do is go to their website and put in your email address and your, your home address and, and they'll mail something to you. New England Biolabs will, will even frequently email you samples of their things like, like DNA ligase and, and other things that you might need to get set up in a lab. So the first thing that you want to do when, when you're designing your protein production, to, just to get down to things, is to choose your organism of interest. Right? And for these lectures, for the most part, we're going to be talking about my favorite organism, which is Escherichia coli. And that's not just because it's my favorite organism, but it's because um, we know an awful lot about E. coli. Right? It is, and, and because of that, it is probably the most widely used protein for protein 
um, production or protein expression. It grows really rapidly. Um, there are some organisms that grow more rapidly than E. coli, but there aren't many. Um, it has very simple nutrition requirements. Those nutrition requirements, like I said earlier, all it really needs is a little bit of digested milk casein, and it'll go. Um, it'll grow to super high densities. Again, you, you, there are organisms that, that do grow to higher densities, but not many. Um, they're relatively easy to lyse. They, they are, and, and as I said, they are model gram-negative organism. We have been studying E. coli and its molecular biology since about 1920. Um, so we know an awful, awful lot about E. coli. Um, so they're very easy to manipulate. We have lots and lots of genetic tools. However, th there are some other options, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't sort of tell you your other options of, of bacteria that you can use. Um, the, 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 before we get to those bacteria, the first thing that you should think about when you sort of want to choose your bacterium is whether you want to choose a, a gram-positive or a gram-negative organism. You should be familiar with the, with the different kinds of bacteria that there are. Um, but just to remind you, there are two sort of overall uh, architectures for bacteria. Um, e. coli, which is what we're going to talk about, is, is, is a gram-negative organism. And what, what that means um, is that, it, of course, bacteria have a cell wall that's made of peptidic lichen, um, and they have a cytoplasmic membrane. Um, and uh, gram-positive bacteria, which is sort of the, the simpler bacteria to think about, have just this cytoplasmic membrane and, and, a, and a cell wall. Um, however, gram-negative bacteria have an additional um, membrane, membrane system that completely encapsulates the cell wall and the cytoplasmic membrane, which causes them to be a little bit more resistant to some drugs. It causes them to, to, to be, and, and one of those drugs is crystal violet. Um, crystal violet stains the cell wall, um, and that's, that's why but the, these organisms are called gram-positive because they get stained with crystal violet, um, and these organisms are gram-negative. Um, there are a number of sort of other differences between these organisms. So, for example, gram-positive bacteria tend to have a slightly thicker cell wall, but the most important thing that you need to bear in mind is that gram-negative organisms, uh, that, that, that gram-negative organisms have this outer membrane. Um, and that's important because the, the outer membrane, uh, I don't know how many of you have taken much microbiology, but the outer membrane um, itself, if you fragment it up, the little lipids in the outer membrane are something called uh, endotoxin. Have you, have you all heard, come, come across endotoxin? Endotoxin is actually the, the, the outer membrane lipids, um, and, and most mammals have developed a system like, in toll-like receptors to, to, to sort of sense these, these lipids. Um, and when, when they bind to those lipids, you, you, you get this uh, response from the bacteria, or fr from your cells, that, that causes massive sort of innate immune response. Um, and if you get too strong of an innate immune response, you get what, that's where toxic shock comes from, right? So, so if you have lots of lysis of bacteria, then you get lots of um, release of these, these outer membrane lipids, and that causes toxic shock, right? Which is the main concern in, in sepsis, if you, if you ever have bacteria infecting you. But it, ca it gets to be a problem um, for you because if you ever purify a human drug from E. coli, Right, something that you plan to give to humans, you have to make sure that your protein is free of endotoxin because you don't want to inject your, your, your drug, your protein-based drug, into a human um, and cause them to immediately go into toxic shock. Right. So here are some, some bacterial species that, that people have advocated using um, for, for protein production, j just to quickly run through them, lactobacillus has been frequently used. That the reason that you usually want, that that you that people would pick lactobacillus is not because it's an easy organism to manipulate, but just because all of the paperwork is already in place to, to consider this organism safe, right? So it's called a, a grass organism, so generally recognized as safe. Right? It's endotoxin-free, so it doesn't have any it doesn't have any outer membrane. It secretes proteins, and because it doesn't have an outer membrane, it secretes proteins directly into the media, so all you have to do is produce, if you want to produce a secreted protein, you just have to produce it and then spin out the bacteria, and then you've got your protein already mostly purified. Um, 
it does have more complex growth requirements. It does grow more slowly. And it has, I mean, the key, the key thing is that it has fewer tools. Um, people have also considered using Pseudomonas, which is another gram-negative bacterium, potentially because it'll produce lots more protein than E. coli. Again, there, there are fewer tools, which is may, maybe one reason why you wouldn't want to use Bacillus. Um, there's Streptomyces species that, that, that are frequently used already um, for commercial use and mainly in antibiotic production, so that's not production of proteins. Um, but if you could engineer Streptomyces to produce a protein, all of the everything's already in place to use products of, of Streptomyces um, in, in humans. Um, and then finally, there's, there's Carinibacterium. So Carinibacterium, Carinibacteria are closely related to the Streptomyces, and, and a lot of the tools that are available for Streptomyces are also available in Carinibacterium. Good, so once you've chosen your organism of interest, the next thing to do is to sit around, is to sort of set up your protein production strategy in that organism. Um, and like I said, the goal of these lectures is to really give you a mental toolkit or at least some sort of theoretical framework to think about these sorts of things. And the theoretical framework that I've chosen is, is, is uh, the central dogma, right? Again, you should all be familiar with this. The central dogma suggests that DNA, which is the hereditary material, the, the genetic material, gets converted into RNA, or mRNA in particular, and the, and the mRNA gets translated into protein. Right? And, and it would be worth going back just to familiarize yourselves with the language around these things. Remember that DNA gets turned into DNA. That process is called replication. DNA gets converted into mRNA, and that process is called transcription. The reason it's called transcription is because DNA and RNA basically speak the same language. You have four very similar bases, and, um, and you, you make a one-to-one -one substitution in terms when you make mRNA from, D, from DNA. The process of turning RNA into protein is frequently called translation because you're turning the three-letter codons, the three-letter words, into a new language, which is the language of proteins. I don't want to belabor the point, but, but there's been some confusion on this in the past, say, for example, on exam questions. Um, and it's worth knowing if, if somebody sort of throws the word translation at you, that, that you know that, that when we're talking about translation, we're talking about conversion of, of an mRNA that you've produced by some other method into protein by ribosomes, right? Good. Um, and thinking about each one of these steps will, will bring us into contact with things like, like vectors. We'll talk about those in a second. Inducible expression, right, is, is the process of turning DNA into mRNA. Um, rare codons is something that comes up when, when we're reading the mRNA and turning it into proteins. And then we'll have to think about proteins and, and things that are a little bit outside of central dogma, like protein folding, post-translational modifications. And then finally, we'll come to eukaryotic protein production. Good, so let's start with the vector. The first thing you generally do when you do, besides picking out your, your organism of interest, which we already know is E. coli, um, is to pick your, your vector. Um, so what is a vector? An expression vector is a piece of DNA. A vector generally is a piece of DNA that carries a, a, another piece of DNA that you're interested in. An expression vector is one, is a piece of DNA that carries a, a gene of interest that encodes a protein of interest so that you can express the gene um, encoding your protein of interest, right? Um, and, it's, and, and a vector just means that it's an easy way to transfer it between different bacterial species. There are really two factors to consider um, when, you're, when you're thinking about which uh, expression vector you want to use. Um, the first one is, is gene copy number. Um, and the second one is, is the induction mechanism. So just to start off with gene copy number, um, I, I mean, the vast majority of protein expression vectors for E. coli are, are all on high copy number plasmids. By, by high copy, I, I mean that, that you have 20 plasmids per cell, right? And, and, and there, there are a lot of advantages to high copy number plasmids. They, they, they're, they're a lot easier to work with. It's a lot easier to purify DNA if you've got a lot of it. But that's a general rule for anything. It's easier to purify a protein if you've made a ton of it, right? Because, it, because you, you get it pure just by competition. Um, 
But there, there are other some practical there are some other practical advantages to having high copy number, and that that's that, that you get this this gene dosage effect. The more copies of a gene you have, the higher the expression tends to be because you can drive transcription from more copies of the gene. If you can drive transcription from more copies of the gene, you'll have more mRNAs. If you have more mRNAs, you'll have more protein, mm -hmm. right? Um, the fact that you can purify more DNA means that the that the protein that the that the vectors tend to be easier to manipulate, um, and because of all of this, uh, you know. People tend to do what's easiest, right? We keep picking the low-hanging fruit, and because we keep picking the low-hanging fruit, there are lots of different there are lots of different tools available in, in terms of high copy number vectors, right? Because again, they're easier to manipulate, so we we do manipulate them. If it's harder to do, we tend not to do it. Um, so cloning can be easy and fast, and, and, and you've got lots of flexibility. The, there are some disadvantages. We'll, we'll come to this in a little bit. High, high protein production levels can lead to aggregation of your protein. Um, if you've got a toxic protein, um, this uh, high copy number plasmid can be a problem. Frequently for, for these, for any gene that you're interested in, you, you, what you want is a switch, right? You want to be able to turn it on and turn it off. But this, this is biology. That nothing ever works the way you want it to, right? So um, even when something is off, and even when you're shutting it off as much as possible, you sometimes get a little bit of leaky, leaky expression. And, and there are... Um, proteins that when expressed in say five to ten proteins per cell will kill your cell, right? That's not exactly ideal um, if you want to produce your protein. Um, and so this can, this can lead to, to cloning problems, it can lead to accumulation of mutations in the protein that you're expressing, right? Because we have to think about genetics. Um, if you have a selection against growth, you will t bacteria will tend to find a way around that and those will be the things that grow. Um, Just to give you an example, again, we've got lots of tools when we talk about high copy number vectors. We, there, there are, uh, this is just a list of sort of a bunch of plasmids that came off the top of my head. There are lots more. Most high copy number plasmids are derivatives of the same plasmid, this plasmid called Coli-1, um, and the parent tends to be this protein, PBR322, and we've built lots of plasmids based on PBR322. There's another high copy number plasmid called PACYC, and there are lots of derivatives of PACYC2. It's very similar to Coli-1, um, but it is high copy number, and, and it does have a different origin of replication. Your second choice for you know, going down the scale from high copy number to low copy number, of course, if you've got high, you've got low, but we've also got a sort of um, medium level of expression, and that typically comes in the form of, of low copy number plasmids. These are plasmids where you tend to find two to five copies. I say copies per cell, but what I mean is copies per genome. So, so you typically would have twice as many to five times as many as if you put it on the chromosome. Um, because you have fewer copies of the gene, um, you might make less of the protein, and that might lead to increased protein solubility. Uh, it might mean that you have less leaky expression because you have fewer copies of the gene to accidentally fire when, when you're making the protein. Um, and finally, that they're just a lot, that they're also relatively easy to manipulate. They're a little bit harder than high copy number plasmids, but they, are, they do replicate autonomously, and that means that it's, and they are, tend to, do tend to be relatively small, which makes them easier to purify than, some, than say, a giant chromosome of a, of a bacterium. Um, again, it's a little bit more difficult to, to purify the DNA. They, they typically have lower expression levels. And, and, and for that reason, just because they're harder to manipulate, we've manipulated them less, and that means that there's fewer sort of out-of-box options. Um, there, a few examples, if you're running across them in the literature, are, are plasmids um, that are based on PSC101, another one called p -mini -F, and, then, and then finally P, P1 is another type of plasmid that gives you a single copy number. Um, P1 is also a bacteriophage um, and switches between life cycles, but it can replicate as a plasmid. Finally, you can get to, to single copies per cell, right, or per chromosome, and that's if you put your gene of interest on the chromosome. Um, in recent years, people have come up with lots of clever ways of putting your gene of interest on the chromosome. Um, so there have been more tools recently to, to do this, but, 
But traditionally, it's been very hard to put your, your, your gene of interest on the chromosome. Um, there are some advantages to doing it if you really think that this is going to be an advantage. I, I mean, so for example, you have fewer copies of a gene. So, so again, you might have less problems with toxicity. You might have better, better solubility of your protein. Um, I work on a protein called SAC-A, and if I put it on a plasmid, um, it doesn't work very well. But if I put it on the chromosome, I have the same amount of protein, and it works better, and I, I, I still don't know why. So sometimes it's, it's worth sort of putting your protein on the chromosome. Um, good. Again, like I say, there are more tools these days, but, but it, it is a little bit more difficult to purify the, the DNA. Um, usually you do this on high copy number plasmids and transfer them over onto the chromosome. Um, there are fewer out-of-box options. Just to give you some, some examples, some ways of getting your gene of interest onto the chromosome, um, one way of doing that might be homologous recombination onto the chromosome. There are ways to increase homologous recombination in E. coli and other organisms. Um, th th there's also a, a, a prophage called lambda, which we, which we might talk about. So lambda is a, is a bacteriophage, and what it does when it infects the host cell is um, sometimes it goes, so bacteriophage are, are bacteria that kill or, or viruses that kill bacteria. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. Um, lambda is something called a lysogenic phage. So when it, when it infects the bacteria, it has a choice. Um, it, can either, it can either do what it's supposed to do and go and kill the bacterium, but a, a low percentage of the time, say about 10% of the time, 20% of the time, what it does instead is it inserts itself onto the host chromosome and stays there stably integrated. Um, and there are ways to manipulate lambda to keep it stably integrated onto the chromosome and express your protein from a, from, from a, from, um, phage lambda. And then finally, of site-specific recombination, um, th this is sort of related to our, to our phage lambda approach. There are lots of lambdoid phages, and, and you can use them to recombine into the chromosome. Just to give you an example of this last one, this is what I was talking about. You have two different types of, of bacteriophages. Um, you have lytic phages that will inject their DNA, and then, and then that leads to, to, to killing of the, of the host, right? You just make more virus particles and then ultimately lyse the host, releasing the, the, the bacterial viruses. Alternatively, what you can have is, is in the case of lambda, your, your chromosome circularizes that inserts into the host chromosome and then divides along with the host chromosome. So basically, it's a parasite living inside your cells. It's a little like a retrovirus, um, except that it inserts at a very specific site on the E. coli chromosome. Sometimes, though, you get an induction event, and that causes the, 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 the bacteriophage to, to sort of excise from the chromosome and go down this lytic pathway again. Um, basically, what you need, though, to go down this pathway, you don't need very much. You need lots and lots of genes to, to have a nice uh, lysis, to, to, to build lots of, of bacteriophage and have those bacteriophage get packaged and ultimately kill the host. Um, but you need surprisingly few genes to, to have this, this, circular lambda chromos the, this circular lambda DNA get inserted onto the host chromosome. One thing that you need is a site a site, a very specific site in the E. coli uh, chromosome. Um, that, that site's called AT-B, right? AT stands for attachment, B stands for bacteria. Um, you require another site on, on, on the bacteria phage called AT-P for, for attachment phage. Um, and then you require a couple of, of uh, recombinases. You require an, a a, a protein called int, which is the, the integrase. It's required for, for inserting the, the DNA, integrating the DNA into the host chromosome. And if you want to get, um, and that's fine if you just want to keep it here stably integrated onto the chromosome. Um, and if you want to get it back out of the host chromosome, you require a second, uh, a second protein called excisionase or excise. It's amazing how creative people can get when, when, they're, when their naming conventions have, have only, you can only use four letters in your naming conventions, but, but somebody came up with a three-letter word that, that stands for excise. Um, so so you, you have int associated with excise, and that, that allows this process to happen for it to excise out of the chromosome. 
Um, there are lots of different lambdoid phages. They all basically work the same way. They all have at Bs and at Ps. They all have integrases and they all have excisionases. Um, and the, the, the sites of attachment um, and the, the, the at Ps in all of the different bacteriophages and in the bacteria themselves are, are all different. Um, so, so what somebody what somebody clever has done is they've gone and, and devised a series of plasmids um, that, called suicide vectors that that require a, 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 a certain host to grow in. They will not grow in a, in a host that does not express a protein called pi. Um, so if you put these plasmids into into most bacteriophage. They'll just go in, and then, and then they'll stay there, and then they won't divide. Nothing will happen because they don't have an origin of replication. But if you put it in a host that contains uh, an integrase that's specific for, for your phage attachment site, so, so say lambda or HK101, this will cause the, the, the plasmid to integrate into a specific site on the host chromosome. And, and you can do this up to four different places on the, on the, on the chromosome based on, based on the vectors that are, that are described by Haldeman and Wanner. Um, and presumably you could do it with even more because there are lots and lots and lots of lambdoid phages with lots and lots and lots of attachment sites. Um, but this is just a toolbox that you could use to actually do that. The old-fashioned way of doing it is a lot harder. The, 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 there, are, there used to be a way of buying sort of lambda DNA, and you could insert your protein of interest. Um, that these lambda D, this lambda DNA contained the, 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 the gene that encodes beta-galactosidase. Beta-galactosidase is, a, if a strain expresses beta-galactosidase and you put it on certain kinds of plates, your, plate, your, your colonies will turn blue or red or whatever. Um, and so if you, if, you have, if you clone your protein of interest into this LACC gene, suddenly your colonies will be white. Um, so it's a way of knowing that you've encoded it. You can package this. The, the, the companies will also sell you pure, empty, empty uh, phage lambda um, phage particles, and, and you can clone it into this DNA and then use all of their special materials to package these empty, these empty phage particles and, and use those to inject the host. I don't know that anybody sells that anymore. Um, because there are many other tools available now, but it's worth knowing about just in theory. Good. That, that, that was all a little confusing, and that's the whirlwind tour. But basically, the thing to remember is that you'll probably end up using a high copy number plasmid, most of which are called PET, in case you're interested, P-E-T. Um, there, there are zillions and zillions of PET vectors out there. And that brings us on to induction mechanism. For the vast majority of time, we'll use a single, a single induction mechanism, right? So when we talk about induction um, mechanisms, what I mean is that usually you're going to have a protein, and you, you probably don't want to make that protein most of the time. You, you could produce the protein constitutively. Right? You could introduce, say, say, your plasmid of interest, you put it into your E. coli strain, um, and it makes the protein constitutively. But this is a bit of a, if that protein's not required for growth of E. coli, um, that's a bit of a drag on the resources of E. coli. And that, that, makes your, that, that usually makes your bacteria grow um, more slowly. It's also a driver, it's also a genetic selection to get rid of that protein or to cause mutations in that protein so that in the end, you don't get the thing that you want. Right, so, so most of the time when people talk about protein production, when, when people go about, go about sort of designing a production approach, um, they usually use inducible expression um, to drive expression of the gene of, of interest. When you think about protein expression, this is, gonna, this is all going to get a little bit fiddly, um, but, but it's, it's worth sort of considering. There are two main mechanisms for, for, for inducible expression. There are uh, repressors, right? And you should all be familiar with repressors because at this point you should all be familiar with how uh, the lac operon works, right? The lac operon works on the basis of a repressor. You have a you have a, a lac repressor called lac I, 
LAC I binds the DNA um, at the LAC operator and prevents transcription of the LAC operon, right? In the presence of an inducer, like IPTG or lactose or any number of other um, small molecule inducers of, of, of the LAC repressor, the LAC repressor lets go of the DNA, and now the RNA polymerase is free to make lots of mRNA. Um, in the case of the LAC operon, that's, that's, that, that is the LAC, the genes that encode the LAC operon, or that, that are encoded in the LAC operon. Um, in, in the case of, of your protein of interest, you could encode a protein of interest just downstream of, this, of the LAC repressor and get production of, of your protein of interest. There's another large class of, of uh, of induction systems, and those those are called activators. And it's worth thinking about activators work. It's worth thinking about these because activators work in the opposite method as as repressors. So instead of Binding to the DNA in the in the absence of repressor, activators tend either not to bind the DNA in the absence of the repressor, or bind it in a certain way that that prevents the association of, of the RNA polymerase. Um, however, in the presence of an inducer, um, the the activator will bind the DNA, and binding of the activator to the DNA recruits. Uh, the RNA polymerase, and that drives transcription of your gene of interest. Um, and this is another large family of, of, uh, of, of regulators. Um, so, for example, induction of the, of the, the arabinose, uh, the ARA operon, which is involved in, in uh, catabolism of, of arabinose, uh, it, is, is induced by this activator mechanism. I once had somebody draw a chart for me, too. If you think about, you've got activators and repressors, but you can also think that small, your small molecule, say IPTG or arabinose um, or tryptophan or fatty acids, can, can turn on expression of a protein or it can turn off expression of a protein. Um, it's just worth knowing that, that all of these approaches exist, right? Um, because it can allow you, if you wanted to, to design a system where you constitutively express your protein of interest, but then at some point you decide you, know, you want to stop expression of your protein of interest, so you add tryptophan and that shuts it off, right? Um, or you add fatty acids and that, that turns off the production of your protein. It's worth knowing about, the, but, but it's worth knowing about the activators and repressors, right? The, these are the ones that are generally useful for protein expression, right? Because usually what you want to do is you want to keep production of your protein off and then at some point turn it on. But it's, it's, it's worth knowing about the mechanisms of these things because uh, they can influence um, what goes on in your, in, in your test tube when you're producing your protein. Right, so, so, in the, so why? I mean, theoretically, why does this even matter? I mean, in both cases, you have cells, you add inducer, you get protein. Great. Right, but, there, but there are some, some issues. So, for example, frequently with, with repressors, what you have is something called leaky expression. Um, do, do, have you all heard of re leaky expression? Right, yeah, e even when you're in the off position you have a little bit of production of your protein of interest, and this is called leaky expression. And repressors are more prone to leaky expression. Um, that's certainly true of LAC. Um, and this, this often isn't a problem, right? Particularly if, say, let's, let's just sort of think, we, we, if we think about production of our protein, right, expression level of our protein, versus the amount of IPTG we have, we see this nice linear relationship between IPTG concentration and expression level. And if your protein isn't toxic, or if it's not toxic at very low levels, fine, doesn't matter, right? But for a lot of proteins, um, your protein is toxic, e even at sort of the, the level of, the, the sort of basal level, leaky expression of, of, your, of your protein. I mean, that can be an issue. It'll cause, again, your cells to grow more slowly. If your cells grow more slowly, there's a genetic selection to cause mutations in the protein that's causing the thing. Most of those mutations are actually going to eliminate the protein or they're going to be, be mutations that eliminate your promoter, um, and all of that's going to cause a problem with protein production. 
right? So one way that people have gotten around this is to do things like, to, to have things like dual repressor systems. Um, they'll combine LAC with the, the LAC repressor with another repressor called the TET repressor so that you only get, um, so that you only get production of your protein when you add both IPTG and, and anhydrous um, tetracycline, right? It's very infrequent that you would have both repressors lifting off the DNA at the same time, and so that lowers the level of basal expression um, and decreases the toxicity. But it, you, have the second op, you have the second problem is that you may never get to as high of expression levels as you do with a single repressor. So you could turn over to, uh, to activators. Um, activators are, are great but, but run into their own set of problems. They don't really want to, to dwell on activators. You run into to sort of a different set of problems. Um, activators also have leaky expression, but, but leaky expression from, from activators is quite different. Um, what, what you tend to have is a... Um, at very low inducer concentrations or no inducer concentrations, say for arabinose, is it looks like you have this basal level expression if you look at the bulk culture, but actually what you have at, at, at these sort of concentrations or maybe even these concentrations are a few cells that are making lots of proteins um, and, fewer, and, and some cells that are making no protein at all. Um, and again, this, this presents you with an interesting... Uh, genetic selection problem, right? Because there's going to be a strong selection against growth in these cells that are making lots of protein and no selection in these cells. So which ones actually take off? Um, if, you, if you get a random mutation in one of these cells that causes them to lose your protein of interest, suddenly they can take off in your population. And th this can be a problem when you're growing things in bulk in a giant culture. Ideally, what you would have um, is a situation right, where you have very, very low level expression or no expression of your protein at, even at low inducer levels. And then at some inducer level, you add, you add your inducer and you get tons of expression. right? So that when you're growing your cells, you have them at very low cell densities, OD1, OD.1, OD.2. I mean, for people growing things in fermenters, that can be OD2 or 3. And then you get induction of your protein when your cells reach really high cell densities, like OD10 if you're growing in a, in a, in a, in a fermenter. Um, and the solution, that the, the, the main solution, that, and, and it's, it's worth sort of taking some time to understand how the system works, um, is is a system that's based on, on inducible expression of, of a T7 um, promoter. Good, so we talked about lysogenic phages earlier, right? Uh, T7 is not a lysogenic phage, it's a lytic phage. It's, if it infects your bacterium, your bacterium will lyse. That's what happens. And if you ever get a T phage infection in your bacteria, just throw everything away, bleach everything, and come back because it will wipe out everything, right? But because T7 uh, has been, it does kill E. coli so efficiently because it has a limited number of genes, we've, we've studied T7, or at least in the early days of bacteriology, people studied um, T7 very closely. When T7, and, and understand sort of the life cycle of T7, so when T7 infects your, your host cell, what happens is it injects a copy of its chromosome, right? And on that chromosome, there's some promoters that will get recognized by the host transcription machinery. So the host RNA, the host RNA polymerase, um, synthesizes the first few genes of, of, the, of the T7 polymerase, right? One of those genes that... that that it recognizes, that it expresses, is a gene that encodes an RNA polymerase, a, a T7-specific RNA polymerase. That RNA polym so, so that T7 RNA polymerase is, is an example of an early protein. That T7 RNA polymerase drives the expression of a bunch of other proteins, right, called middle proteins. Um, and some of these middle proteins sort of go back and regulate T7, the T7 RNA polymerase to drive the assembly of, to drive the production of late proteins. These late proteins eventually result, one of these is a holon that, that pokes great big holes in the cytoplasmic membrane um, and releases a lysozyme, and that lysozyme causes release of the bacteriophage into the culture. 
um, and, the, and the cycle starts over again. But what somebody thought, right, is that, okay, if we just start with this early bit of it, one of these early proteins is this T7 RNA polymerase. T7 promoters, right, in this phase, you want, in this phase of growth, you want to make lots and lots and lots of, of, of bacteriophage-specific proteins. So T7 promoters are actually, they're really, really strong. So what happens if we sort of manipulate um, the bacterial system to make lots and lots and lots of protein. Um, so, so what somebody did was they took the gene encoding the T7, uh, T7 RNA polymerase, they put it under control of a lactose promoter, and then put it in single copy on the E. coli chromosome um, at the lambda attachment site. So the, the, this bacteriophage is called, typically called BL21DE3. The D, BL21 is the bacterial strain, and DE3 is the, is the bacteriophage that contains the T7 RNA polymerase. Now, normally, this T7 RNA polymerase is off. Um, but if you add some lactose, what happens is, as you make the T7 RNA polymerase, the T7 RNA polymerase recognizes this strong, will recognize the T7 promoter and drive the expression of genes that are under this T7 promoter. Now, normally that's not, a, that's not an issue, but usually what you have, if you're doing a protein expression, what you'll have is you'll have a plasmid that contains a T7 promoter, oops, driving expression of your, of your protein of interest. Um, that will probably be the strongest promoter around, and that will cause the cell to make lots and lots and lots of your protein. Now, as I mentioned, uh, T7, sorry, the, the LAC operon is a little bit leaky, so you've always got a little bit of leaky expression of this TNA, T7 RNA polymerase, and that potentially could cause toxicity issues. But people have tried to get around this by, by putting the RNA polymerase under the control of lots of other inducible expressions, so say phosphate limitation, um, osmotic shock, cold shock, heat shock, or abnus. Um, and, and all sorts of other things, right? Some of these, some of these things have gotten to be really clever. So, so what, what some people will do is they, they put the, what some people have done is they put the T7 RNA polymerase under control of, of, of the pho regulon. What happens then, so pho stands for phosphate um, uptake. What happens then is you grow your cells in, in media that's sort of limited for phosphate. And it's limited in such a way so that you run out of phosphate right when you reach the OD that you want to express your protein. Right? So all you need to do really is make up your media, and if you've made it up the right way, you add your, your, your bacteria that, that, that's, produced, that's supposed to produce your protein of interest, um, and all you have to do is let it grow. It grows up, it hits the phosphate limiting condition that fires the, the T7 RNA polymerase promoter, and you've got tons of protein. And people have done this in all sorts of, of clever ways. Um, you, can also, you can also manipulate the system in a little way. There's a way that, that, that we've done in the past to shut off production of host genes. So, for example, there's, a, there's an antibiotic called rifampicin. Rifampicin um, inhibits the bacterial uh, RNA polymerase but doesn't seem to inhibit the, the phage RNA polymerase. Um, so, so, it's, so what you can do is you can turn on ex production, you can turn on expression of your T7-driven promoter, um, and then, and then hit the cells with a little bit of rifampicin, and that will drive just the, the production of your protein of interest. That's, that's, really, that's really useful if you're doing labeling, right? So, so say you want to label with a really expensive um, uh, isotope, heavy isotope or, or radiolabeled isotope. You, 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 can, you can grow your cells up. Um, you add a little bit of IPTG, to, you add your IPTG to induce T7 RNA polymerase, get enough T7 RNA polymerase, add the, the the, the rifampicin shut off the, the expression from the host genomes, and then the only thing that will get labeled is, is anything that's being uh, expressed from the T7 promoters. Good. Um, I think it's hard to pay attention for more than about 40 or 50 minutes. Um, so I think that we should take a little bit of a break here. I didn't quite make it as far as I want to, but my second lecture doesn't have as much stuff in it. So we can always push it off to next time if we need to.
Um, so why don't we take uh, a seven minute break? Um, and if you could all be back here by about five after, we'll pick up again. Okay? And we're back. With, I, I hope you all enjoyed your short break. I'll, I'll try to get through the rest of this material, but as I say, I usually end a little bit early on the second day, so if I don't quite get through everything, um, I felt like it was better to sort of go through, through things slowly anyway. Um, once you've picked out your, your, your protein production strategy, it's usually easiest to design your protein production strategy first, um, ju just because it's all theoretical. You can, you can go on the internet and find whatever, whatever expression vectors you want to use. It, pick your, pick your, your um, inducible expression system that you want to pick. And do, it, do all of your clonings online before you design all of your primers to, to, to amplify the DNA that you want to clone into your... Into your expression vector. Um, but at some point you get down to the practical, right? So the next thing that you'll probably want to consider is your growth conditions. Um, so fortunately, growth conditions in bacteria are relatively straightforward. Uh, because they're straightforward, that, that introduces its own set of complexities. But, but, it, but just, just to thinking about things, um, you really have two types of media. You have rich media and you have defined media. Um, most people just use rich media when they want to express their protein of interest. The reason that you would use rich media um, is just because it's really easy to make, right? You can, uh, we, we typically use, for genetics experiments, we'll use a, a media called LB. Um, people say it's Luria Britanni because it first came up in a, in a paper by Britannia, Britannia and Luria. It actually stands for lysogeny broth, but <laughs> take it how you will. Um, the, 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 but, but people make, people make uh, LB broth, you know, the companies make LB broth pre-mixed. All you have to do is add a bit of water, right, and, and the thing grows. Um, they also, there's another, right, so some advantages, and, and they make lots of rich media this way, just sort of pre-mixed. Pre All you have to do is add water. Um, there are lots of advantages to this, right? It's, it's really easy to make. All you have to do is mix it up. And even if you had to mix up the individual components, LB is made of three things. It has a triptych digest of, of milk casein. It's a little bit of yeast extract and some salt, right? Most rich media are like this. Um, it tends to be that, that they promote really rapid growth. They're not ideal carbon sources, but they still promote rapid growth. And there's lots of raw material for protein expression because you're growing on amino acids. You don't have to make your own amino acids to, to make the protein of interest, right? You just bleed some of the, the protein, the, the, the amino acids off from, from catabolism, right? To, to make your protein of interest. E. coli, by the way, will grow on anything. It will grow on amino acids, it'll grow on sugars, it'll grow on lipids. Right, um, But when you're growing in rich media, it's worth considering that you are growing on amino acids. Some disadvantages is, it, for, for rich media is that it's not necessarily well formulated. It's just what you happen to have lying around. Traditional rich media are, are based on things that we could get lots and lots and lots of and that are rich in protein. Right? We have our, our main carbon so our, our main um, protein sources are milk casein because of the dairy industry. We've got lots of yeast because, yeast extract because of the uh, um, baking and and, um, and and beer industries. Uh, we we have beef broth because of all the slaughterhouses because you have all this waste from beef broth. You can just boil it up, release all the amino acids, and use that. Same thing for for pig broth, and you've, so so that's brain heart infusion auger because nobody wants the brains through the hearts. Um, and we have, and we have um, triptych soy digest, so we make lots and lots of, of soy uh, out there. So there's lots and lots of soy available, so, so, so we just release all the proteins and use that. Right? It's not that E. coli is used to growing on this stuff, it's just that we happen to have lots of this lying around and it's cheap. Um, right, so just, just to run through some basic types of of media, I mean, the most common one is, is a media called LB. Um, it's worth considering not using LB for protein expressions. People do it all the time anyway, 
but, but LB is, it starts to get starved for preferred amino acids when, when you start getting late in log phase. Um, there's lots of, by the way, there's lots of serine around in LB, but most of the, most of the, the, the amino acids in LB are locked in these long chain um, polypeptides that the E. coli for some reason has a problem chewing up and bringing into the cell. Um, so it's not really a balanced media. It's, it's, more, it's more biased towards amino acids that E. coli doesn't prefer to use um, as, as carbon sources, or biased against sort of non-preferred um, amino acids. Um, it's got a very low sugar content, too. E. coli really prefers to grow on sugars rather than on amino acids. Um, and not, not all the amino acids are bioavailable bio because um, they're locked in long chain. Uh, polypeptides. It's, you know, if you're interested in this topic, there's, there's an interesting blog article at, at, at a blog called Small Things Considered, which is put out by the American Society for Microbiology. Um, it's, it's a little bit detailed, but, but it does sort of give you the idea of why you may not want to use LB. Good, but we've known this problem with, with LB for a long time. Uh, so, so people have come up with lots of other rich media. There's something called 2YT, which is LB, but you've added twice the amount of tryptone and yeast extract. We have another one called SOB, which is a slightly different formulation of the same things, but we've added some potassium and some magnesium. LB is really li limited for magnesium for, because um, none of the things that you add to it really contain magnesium. Magnesium is really required for growth, so, so really you could add some magnesium to LB and your E. coli would grow a lot faster. Um, SOC, you add a little bit of glucose to SOB and you've got SOC. Um, you've got trific broth, which is supposed to be even better. It's got, it's got some phosphate buffer in there to keep the bacteria from growing too basic or too acidic and killing themselves. Um, and then you've got something called super broth, which has just got tons and tons and tons of peptone is, is essentially a, a different digested milk casein than, than tryptone is. Um, it's worth mentioning at this point, right? Two of these types of media uh, have added carbon sources to them, and it's, it's worth, besides the amino acids, it's worth considering whether you ought to add another type of carbon source to your growth media. So, so the typical thing to add to your growth media that really promotes growth of E. coli um, is glucose. Glucose may not be the greatest thing to add if your inducible expression system if you induce expression of your protein yeah. from a lactose-inducible promoter um, or from an arabidose-inducible promoter. And, and, and the reason for that is sometimes some, something called catabolite repression. So E. coli has this very stereotyped preference for different carbon sources. Um, if you add glucose to cells, it will, it will prefer to use the glucose before it moves on to other sugars like lactose or arabinose. Um, and what that means is that is that if you're growing on glucose, um, you will have expression from your lactose-inducible promoters shut off um, as long as there's glucose around, so you're not going to get optimal expression. You'll also see something like dioxic growth, right? So, so I, I don't know if you've ever seen this curve, but... But if you ever grow E. coli on two different carbon sources, say uh, lactose and, and, and glucose, what you'll see is E. coli will grow in this first phase. Um, this is growth on glucose, and then you'll run out of glucose, and then it'll take a little bit to turn on the genes that are required for utilization of lactose, right? And if your protein is driven by this expression, you won't have any, any production of your protein until you run out of glucose. Good. Your other option then, if you don't want to use rich media, is to use defined media. Generally, defined media is better for genetics experiment because it's it's defined, so you can you can control a lot more of what's going on. Um, it's more reproducible. It's much better for metabolic labeling, right? Because you don't have to worry about competition with all of this complex mixture of amino acids and sugars and other crap that's around. Um, there are some sort of dis there are many disadvantages though, and that's in general, minimal media does not promote. Um, it's rapid of growth of E. coli. Um, you could view this as, as a benefit, right? Because you have a defined media, you could optimize your growth conditions more. Um, but it could be a disadvantage, too, because some people get bogged down in optimization and never sort of get it quite right. Um, and then it's also, it's, it's fiddly and it's more expensive. 
right? You have the whole gamut for defined media. So you, you can go from very minimal, which is sort of a, a salt, you can use a, a sort of minimal salt called M9, um, which is just sort of your, your C. Hopkins Cafe, right? Are you all familiar with C. Hopkins Cafe? C. Hopkins Cafe is a, is a way of remembering what are the, the essential elements for life. You have a carbon source, uh, hydrogen and oxygen, which you're never gonna get away with, phosphate, potassium, nitrogen, sulfur, calcium, and, and, and iron. E. coli doesn't really need um, iodine, so, so the I is in, in, in brackets. Um, and E. coli really doesn't typically need too much calcium, and there's, there's tons of calcium around anyway, so you don't tend to worry about that. Um, but really, it has all, M9 has everything you need. You've got, you've got your phosphate sources, which double as a buffer to prevent sort of this, the culture from going too acidic or too basic. You've got sodium chloride and some potassium um, and some magnesium, and, and everything is fine. Interestingly, C. Hopkins Cafe does not include magnesium. And I've only just noticed it now, and magnesium is absolutely essential for growth, and it is not a trace element. Um, people have been going off of this acronym for a very, very long time, and, and, this is the, and, and I've been going off of this acronym for a very long time. This is the very first time that I've noticed that it, has, it doesn't contain magnesium. Good. You can go from sort of really simple, minimal salts like M9, so all you really have to do is add a, a, a carbon source to M9, or you can go to completely defined, defined but, but what we call a complete media that contains everything that E. coli needs under optimum conditions. And the, the best example of this is a medium called MOPS. Um, e. coli grows in MOPS in, in, even better than it grows in LB. Um, Good, so this is, where, this is where we were supposed to break before. Um, and, and usually I end the break by saying, okay, you've got this wonderful plan. This is science for you. This is, I, I just want to introduce a little bit of reality into, into, your, into your lecture. Um, you have this wonderful plan. You have your protein of interest, you clone it, you sequence it, the sequence is perfect, it's in the right place, it's supposed to give you tons of expression because it's a T7 promoter and you put it in a strain that you know has a functioning RNA polymerase. Um, what you expect then in the precondition, in, in sort of your, your strain, is you, you express the protein, you don't see any protein, you, you, you add your inducer, say IPTG, you get, and you expect this big fat band, but what you see more often than not is absolutely nothing. You just don't get any expression of your protein of interest. Um, so it's, it's usually at this point that you start asking yourself the question, what went wrong? Right? So the rest of these lectures, you, you, know, you can only plan so much. Right? We've gone through all of the planning, and now your question is to ask yourself, what went wrong? And the idea is to use this sort of theoretical framework or this theoretical toolkit to sort of figure that out. To, to change what you're doing. And I like to think about the theoretical toolkit, or I like to think about what went wrong um, based, on a, based on a principle called the Anna Karenina principle. Um, has anybody read, has anybody read uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel? There's a book called Guns, Germs, and Steel by a guy named Jared Diamond, and, and in it he, puts, he, he suggests this idea um, for domestication of animals that he calls the, 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 the Anna Karenina principle which comes from the very first line of Anna Karenina, which says that happy families are all alike, um, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, right? So you, you, if, you, if you substitute families with protein production, you can say that good protein productions are all alike, right? Like everything lines up and everything works. But when something goes wrong, it can go wrong in any number of different ways, um, potentially even an infinite number of ways. And so, so the idea is to go back and figure out how it went wrong. Um, some, but, but, and, and our idea is to go through, through some common ways that things can go wrong. Um, the first way that things can go wrong is through genetic alterations to the strain or to the vector or to the gene of interest. So if we're thinking back to our T7 expression, what we're hoping for is on-off expression and hopefully our basal level of production of our protein, right, that is without inducer, is, is low enough um, that, that, that we don't have any toxicity of the protein. But sometimes the proteins are so toxic that even at the basal level of expression, or sometimes our, our, our 
um, plasmid is leaky enough that even at the basal level of expression, we see toxicity. If there's, and this is where sort of at least the passing knowledge of bacterial genetics is useful. There's, there's one rule in bacterial genetics, and that's that you always get what you select for, right? And in this case, what you're always selecting for, particularly in batch culture, is you're always selecting for the thing that grows fastest, right? So anything that is detrimental to cell growth is a selectable trait. And the easiest way, the easiest way to select, the, 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 the most common thing that happens to get around that selectable trait is to introduce a mutation that, that eliminates, say, your toxic protein. Right? If, if production of a protein is toxic, you just get, make a mutation in that toxic protein. You don't make it anymore, and it's not toxic anymore, so you don't have to worry about it. Right? Or, in, in the case of the T7 polymerase, right, T7 is encoded on a bacteriophage, and for unknown reasons, um, the lambda phage in, in BL21 likes to just sort of excise out of the chromosome when you get rid of it. Um, and, and this can present a real problem, right? Particularly if, if, this, if this sort of event happens in the middle of growth in a, in a fermentable culture. Um, so it's best to, to, to really, be, really be gentle and nice to your bacterial strains. Um, the, the, the most common place for this to happen, right, is, is when, you, when you come out of a glycerol stock. Most people, when they take their glycerol stocks, it's, so we store our strains in, in, in a minus 80 freezer as a glycerol, as a stock that we've stabilized with a bit of glycerol. And what many people do is they, they take a little bit of their glycerol stock and they inoculate their culture directly, right? And you have a, you, you add it here and you have this, this, this lag phase that you normally get and then you have an exponential phase and then you enter into this overnight culture which we call stationary phase. Um, but the problem is, is that sometimes the, the, these strains that are expressing your protein of interest don't, don't recover very well, right? So if your strain recovered like this, and here you have a mutation that allows you to take off, your culture will start to get dominated by, by a clone that does not make your, your protein of interest. Um, like I said, this can happen in a, number, in, in a couple of different ways. So, for example, you can get a mutation in your gene of interest, or you can get a mutation that inactivates your RNA polymerase. I mean, both of those will, will eliminate production of the toxic protein. Now, if you're worried about this, people, you know, this has been a problem for a long time, so people have come up with tools to avoid this. One of the tools that people have come up with is, is to co-express um, a protein called T7 lysozyme. Lysozyme is supposed to kill cells, right, because it degrades their cell wall. And T7 lysozyme is produced by T7 in the cytoplasm. And what happens is, is in the late stages, uh, T7 makes what you call a holon. The holon pokes these giant holes in the cytoplasmic membrane and releases the lysozyme into the periplasm where it chews up the cell walls and causes the cells to burst, right? Um, now, what you can do is you can take that lysozyme um, and co-express it in, in your E. coli cell and your plasmid here. And uh, because there's no hole in, you don't have to worry about it getting poking a hole and then going out into the cytoplasm, going out into the periplasm and degrading your cell wall. But T7 lysozyme has a second property, and that's that in the late stages. Of, growth, of, of the T7 life cycle, the buildup of lysozyme starts to inhibit the T7 polymerase because suddenly you don't need to make the mRNAs for the late genes anymore. You just need to shut it off. So you can, what you can do is you, by, by sort of co-expressing um, T7 lysozyme, you can tamp down or sort of play with what essentially what used to be an on-off switch. Right? T7 by itself is sort of on-off. It makes stuff or it doesn't. But by adding T7 polymerase, you can start titrating the switch a little bit by sort of playing with the activity of the T7 polymerase. Um, one thing, that th this has led to, to one problem that we've, again, that we've known for a very long time, and that's when you, so let's say you've transformed your, say you're producing your protein from a high copy number plasmid, um, and you transform your plasmid 
into BL21, you get a lot of colonies on your LB plates. Um, and what we've known for a long time is that some of these colonies produce more protein than others, and, and nobody really knows quite why. So, so what, uh, what people will do is they'll, is they'll pick multiple different colonies, say one, two, three, four, and five, and what you'll see is different protein expression levels from each one of these, from cultures started from each one of these colonies. And you'll pick an overnight culture that has given you the best expression. Um, now, this is a tried and true method, so, so it's worth doing, particularly if, if your advisor tells you that you should do it. But I suspect that a lot of the times this is due to stochastic differences, so genetic selection in the culture that you were using to produce the protein. Um, and that's because the, the method that I typically use is, is, is this sort of, if you can't beat them, join them approach. Um, is I'll flood all the colonies on the plate. I'll, I'll flood the plate with, say, LB, pool all of the, the, the transformants, and use that to start my protein expression. And, and almost always you get really good protein production levels. Almost always. Um, so uh, what that tells you is probably that every time you do a protein production in E. coli, you should probably transform your plasmid freshly. Um, and whether you start your, your, your cultures from, from individual colonies or whether you start it from pooling, um, it's, it's definitely worth doing a fresh transformation. This is a bit of an aside and only because I find it interesting and again, a bit interesting to think about. Um, and only because you might see this sometime if you do, if you, if you do decide to produce a protein in a lab. Um, one of the things that you typically see uh, it is, a, is a transformation problem, right? So we, and, and, and the problem stems from the fact that we usually prepare our DNA in one strain of E. coli called, called K12, and we usually produce our, 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 um, produce our proteins in another strain of E. coli called BL21. Um, K12 belongs to the E. coli A family of bacteria, and, and, and BL21 belongs to the E. coli B family of bacteria. Um, and, and this creates a problem. The problem is, is that typically the DNA that you've prepared, that you've did, used to do your cloning, um, that you've PCR'd up and you've made and you know is right, right? You transform it into your BL, you, you transform it into DH5 alpha, which is a K12 strain. You get lots of transformants. You transform it into BL21 and you get, you know, maybe a tenth the number of transformants if you're lucky. And, and this happens regularly. And usually what people blame this on right, is, the, is they, they tend to think that their protein is toxic, right? And they're getting leaky expression. Um, and this is why, from, from the, the, the RNA polymerase, because this strain does not contain the, RNA, the T7 RNA polymerase, and this one does, you're getting leaky expression. The protein is toxic, and so you don't get production of your protein. But it actually comes from, from a different mechanism um, ca called restriction modification. Have you all run into restriction modification before? I know that you have, but you just may not realize it. I don't see any nodding heads. You, are you all familiar with restriction modification or restriction systems? Good, again, I, I know that you have because you've probably run into restriction enzymes. Right. Restriction enzymes are enzymes that cut the DNA of interest. So, so restriction enzymes are all derived from restriction modification systems, and these are meant to these are around people think to prevent invasion invasion from foreign DNA in bacteria. So what you have is back, you know, so you would think, okay, bacteria are the ones that normally make these restriction enzymes, these restriction endonucleases. So why aren't they chopping up all their own DNA? Right? They, they, have they just eliminated all of the recognition sites? Well, that's, that's just not possible with, like, say, a four-base cutter, a six-base cutter. I mean, that, that would be tons of sites all over the chromosome. Um, so what they actually have in tandem is a modification system that typically methylates and, and, and adenine, um, and that prevents recognition by the, by the restriction endonuclease. Right? So that what happens is, is, say, if you take a foreign piece of DNA, say DNA that's been prepped from K12, 
and you put it in a strain that has a different restriction modification system, like BL21, BL21 chops up this DNA because it recognizes it as foreign because it's not methylated at the BL21 restriction endonuclease sites. So you get really, really terrible transformation rates. People first noticed this with phage, actually. Um, it may even constitute a species barrier. But the funny thing is, is that every once in a while, say a tenth or hundredth of the time, you'll get a transformant in this BL21 strain. And if you were to prep the DNA from that strain and transform it again, you'd have a really high frequency of transformation because this DNA is now modified with the BL21 uh, modification system. So it won't get recognized by the restriction endonuclease. Right. So, so this, uh, we, we could do the same thing with bacteriophage, which again was how it was originally identified. You, you grow bacteriophage on one strain, you try and um, grow that bacteriophage on the same strain, you get lots of colonies. You try and grow it on a different strain, you get very few uh, lysates. In this case, if you transform um, DNA from, DH, from a K12 strain and put it into an E. coli B strain, you get very few um, colonies. Uh, but if you were to prep the DNA from one of these colonies and retransform E. coli B, you'd get lots of colonies. Right? It's, it's worth thinking about because, you know, once you do your cloning and you manage to get it in E. coli B, you might think, okay, I need to prep some more DNA, but, oh, God, I never get very many transformants. Um, the reason might be because of restriction modification. So you might think about instead of prepping it from your, your, minus, your glycerol stock of the K12 strain, you could try and prep it from from a B strain instead. So why not just use, I mean, that raises another question. Rather than prep your DNA from BL21 and go through all this, this business of, of, of transforming it in K12 and putting it in a different strain, why not just express your protein of interest in a, in, in a K12 strain like MG1655 or DH5-alpha or something? Well, the reason is really historical. Um, BL21 they use because it, it has very low activity of a, of a specific uh, protease called LON, right? And that's basically the only reason. <laughs> if you go back and read the original paper, their reasoning is not very clear. Um, Good. Another problem, besides not any expression of your protein of interest or expression of a, of, a, of a truncated protein, for example, another problem that you might run into um, is that you have very low tr uh, translation of the protein of interest. Right? You might have low protein synthesis levels. You know that your protein is getting induced. You might even be able, to, nobody does these anymore, but you might even be able to um, detect it by northern blotting or microarray. Or, or, or whatever, um, but you just don't have really good translation efficiencies. Right? So the first thing to look at if this happens, usually the first thing, once you've sort of ruled out problems with, with, your, with your induction system, the thing, you, the, the thing that, you, that people really start to optimize, right? this is where the real fiddling begins, um, is, with, is with translation. Right, your protein synthesis. And the first thing that, 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 that you should really look at is to look at the five prime end of the mRNA. Um, one of the things that you can look at, at the, this is the first place you should really look. What, one of the things that you'll find, um, that you should find at the five prime end of, of, your, of your mRNA is something called the Shine Delgarno site, um, which is named for two guys, Shine and Delgarno. Right? Makes sense. Um, so, Unlike eukaryotic ribosomes, bacteria have, t tend to have these little ribosome binding sites uh, located just upstream of, of the start codon, right, that they call either Shine Delgarno or, or, or a ribosome binding site. So you'll see them as, as an SD sequence or, or an RBS sequence or, or, or something similar. Um, and that, that site matches a loop in the 16S RNA that sort of Puts the 16S, that puts the, the small subunit of the ribosome in the right place to start translations. It's usually within five to 10 nucleotides of the, of the AUG start. Now, a lot of vectors, 
a lot of, 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 of plasmid vectors have a, a shine delgarno site, an optimized shine delgarno site, a ribosome binding site designed into them. Um, that's true of the P-trick plasmids. That's true of many of the PET plasmids. Um, and, it's, it's worth, and, and it's worth checking the literature on your plasmid to see if somebody has designed in a ribosome binding site. Um, because, uh, for, for one thing, you want to make sure that your protein is sort of in frame with that um, binding site. So, for example, in the P-trick plasmid, there's, there's an NCO1 site. Um, and NCO1 is a restriction enzyme, right? Um, and, and NCO1, the sequence for the NCO1 site contains an AUG. And that AUG in the NCO1 site is perfectly lined up with the ribosome binding site, right? If it, if it were five, five bases down, well, ten bases downstream, it, it wouldn't be lined up and very well lined up anymore, so you wouldn't get production. Um, the other reason for, for looking at this is because some vectors um, don't contain optimized ribosome binding site. That's true of, of some, but not all, P-bad plasmids. So P-bad plasmids are ones that drive expression from an arabinose-inducible promoter, and they are things that, that you'll run into, right? You tend to run into P-trick plasmids, which are lactose-inducible, or you tend to run into P-bad plasmids, which are rabinose-inducible, and then you run into the PET plasmids, which tend to be T7-inducible. Right? And, and many of the P-bad plasmids don't have a ribosome binding site in them. Good, so now you've checked that you have the right ribosome binding site. The next thing to sort of look at is to, is again, checking at the five prime end of the tRNA is to, everybody thinks, oh yeah, the, the most important thing is to get that start code on, and after that everything will be fine. But oddly in bacteria, um, one thing that people have noticed is that the second code on actually matters a lot. Um, you have a start code on, so in E. coli, the, the start code on can be pretty typical, or it can, can be, it's pretty flexible. Um, for most codons, you'll remember that the third position is the wobble position, so you can get um, substitutions at that third position, and you'll tend to get the same amino acid. For, for, the, for the start codon, the, the wobble is the opposite. It's the, it's the first position that's, that's, that's wobblable. Um, the second codon, though, can, can really, really has an impact on, on, on protein production levels. Um, and the more U-rich the second codon is, A-rich? A rich, the second codon is, the, the, the better the expression of the protein. So um, the best expression levels are when the second codon is, is AAA, which encodes a lysine. So if you've got, if you've got an M, uh, a methionine lysine, a MK, right, you're going to get the best expression levels. Both lysine codons do better expression, but you even see a difference between the two lysine codons, AAG and AAA. Um, and, and there's a couple of papers. There's a paper that, that sort of produces, has, has uh, looked at this effect of, of, the, of, the, of the A content of the second codon, and you can see that, that, that there is a big effect um, of the amino acid at the second position, or of the codon in particular at the second position. Good, a final thing to sort of think about, um, not, not that there's a ton that you can do about this and, and unless you, you totally redesign the mRNA that encodes your protein of interest, is that secondary structure near the, near the five prime end of the mRNA has a, can have really, really big effects on protein production levels. Right? So if you have secondary structure in that five prime region, that tends to prevent the ribosome from, from efficiently interacting um, with the mRNA and sort of escaping the, the, the ribosome binding site and making lots of protein. It'll tend to just stall at the beginning and, and stop. Um, it, it can be really hard to spot this, and there's not a lot you can do to, to, about that. But if you do spot it, the way to get around this is, you know, these days, you can just write a company um, and say, can, can you make a, a different protein for me? Right, but just just sort of clone um, a protein that has the, that's uh, codes for the same sequence of protein, but is encoded by different um, codons, um, and that might disrupt the secondary structure that you get at the five prime end. Good. That that does raise another issue, right? and that's codon optimization. 
Um, one of the things that people frequently do when they want to produce um, a protein that is not an E. coli protein in E. coli is they'll optimize the codon usage for E. coli. Right? This is called codon optimization. Um, and it, it, it comes from a bias for in E. coli to using, in, in, in fact, in every organism, for using certain codons over other codons. Right? The genetic code is redundant, right? so you should all be familiar with that. You, you have uh, multiple codons uh, will code for the same amino acid. Right? For some of these, you'll have six codons coding for the same amino acid. Right? Lysine has two, cod two codons that code for lysine. Um, trying to think, ah, right, but th they should all be up there, right? You can see that there are, there are six leucine codons, um, and there's, there's one methionine codon and one tryptophan codon. Right? But for these, for these codons where you have multiple multiple codons, um, you, don't, you, you might think that, well, it's just evenly distributed upon, uh, between each of the codons for which ones you use. But actually, um, some of them you use a lot more frequently than others. Right? You, 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 know, you tend to use CUG much more frequently than you use CUC. Um, and th this can lead to a problem, right? For, for some of these uh, codons, say if you wanted to express it, an E. coli protein in, in humans, or sorry, a, a, a human protein in E. coli, what you'll find um, is that some of the, the codons in the, in the human protein are just not very frequently used in E. coli, right? So for example, if we just take insulin, the cDNA for insulin, you'll see that there are a lot of codons in here. Um, these red codons um, are codons that, that, that are not frequently used in E. coli. So, so what this is, is this is a, a readout from a codon, a, a, a codon optimization um, tool from this, from this website right here. Um, you have your codon coming down like this. You have the amino acid that that codon encodes at the bottom. And here you see the frequency of usage of that codon in E. coli. And bars that are red are ones that just aren't very frequently used in E. coli. What you can do is you can use this tool, right? And, and you can change these codons um, to, to things that are more frequently used in E. coli. So the, so the question is, is does codon usage even matter? Um, and in fact, it, it looks like it does, right? This is just an example from, from one paper. Um, but, but it does look like some codons um, give higher production of a protein than other codons. So the authors use an algorithm to predict um, translation rates or, or protein production rates based on, based on tRNAs and, and, and codon pairing um, to predict the speed of translation um, as measured by the rate of synthesis. And you can, you can find that, that paper in this, this JMB article. Now, algorithms are great, but what does that mean in the real world? There are always exceptions, right? So you still see if... There's another paper that goes and looks at, at protein synthesis rates based on codon usage, um, and they also find significant differences in the codons that are used. Um, so... For example, um, there's a, there are several um, asparagine codons. There's one asparagine codon that tends to, to give really good production levels and another asparagine codon that tends to give very low production levels, right? Um, the same thing is true of histidine. There are a couple of histidine codons that give different expression levels. Um, and here's a serine codon, right? They're, most serine codons are okay, but one serine codon in particular, if your protein is rich in it, tends to give uh, really poor production levels. Um, the reason that I say that, that you know, you have to take codon optimization, and what I'd like to say with this is that you should take codon optimization with a grain of salt, right? Because in the, in the previous figure that I just showed you, these two are infrequently used codons. This asparagine and this histidine are infrequently used codons. So, so this is consistent with the idea that codon usage um, in E. coli can, can dictate um, translation rates. But um, th 
this serine codon actually has a conjugate tRNA, and it's actually fairly frequently used in E. coli, but still gives relatively poor production levels. Right, so we still don't understand everything about the connection between codon usage and protein production. Right, it looks like it has some effect on protein production, but how, but the, 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 but how codons affect protein production isn't entirely clear. Right. In any case, you can, you can um, optimize code, protein codon expression. This often does lead to higher um, protein production levels, or people wouldn't really be using it. Um, and there are tools to do that. Again, you can go to IDT, uh, which is a, a company in Iowa where I'm from. That'll, it's a big biotech company that will do this for you for, for free. Another option, right, if you're really worried about rare codons, right, your protein is just chock full of rare codons, another thing that you can do is there are a series of plasmids. So, for example, there's one called P-codon plus um, that you can buy from Agilent that's already in a BL21 strain. There's another, there's another plasmid called P-rare, which is in a, in a um, strain called Rosetta from, from Merck Millipore, so the Novagen branch of Merck Millipore. Um, and what these have is they have the genes uh, for the different rare, for tRNAs, genes <laughs> that will express the tRNAs for rare codons in E. coli. And this, this can lead to higher production of your protein. I, and I've put some, some information about Rosetta and P-Rare on, onto Canvas. Good. Finally, you can, you can run into, you know, you can get around some of the problems um, with producing proteins in, vi in vivo, right, by just producing the protein in vitro. You don't, you know, if you produce the protein, it's, so in a completely purified system in vitro, right, in vitro systems have several advantages. You don't have to worry about any genetic selection, right, because you're not growing any bacteria up. You don't, you don't have to worry about um, any sort of alterations to your gene because you can get genes purified from, from a different system that doesn't express the protein or where that protein isn't toxic and you just you add it to your protein production system. Um, and basically you add T7 RNA polymerase um, and that makes your mRNA. And, and the system already contains ribosomes and everything you need to make protein. Um, these systems range from sort of partially purified systems, um, which you can buy from, is it Merck? I don't remember. Um, to to, to, to um, completely, totally purified systems um, called, for example, this Pure system, which was designed by a Japanese group and is now sold by, by New England Biolabs, um, that contains completely purified proteins, pure ribosomes, all of, all of the purified tRNA synthetases, all of the purified tRNAs, um, uh, all of the purified elongation factors, initiation factors, and termination factors, and everything you would ever want for protein production. Um, in addition, this T7, th th this pure system has, has an additional advantage, and that's that everything, all of the different components for this pure system were all purified using a nickel affinity column, so they all contain his tags. So what you can do is you can produce your protein, take the whole mixture, pass it back over a nickel column, and all of the, 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 the as long as your protein doesn't stick to a, to, a, to a nickel NTA column, or a nickel column of some kind, um, you pull out all of the, the proteins that were involved in protein production, and what's left is your protein of interest, right here. Um, you know, it's fine if it's, a, if it's a highly expressed protein, but for a protein that's not very highly expressed, that can be a real, that can be a real benefit. Um, there, are some, there are some advantages to this. I mean, so typically there's just less optimization because you don't want to screw with the system too much. Um, if you start screwing with translation systems too much, you start breaking things. Um, they're easier purification, protein purification, just because there's, there's less stuff there, right? And you can do this reverse purification systems. However, there are some, some disadvantages. Um, one disadvantage is that you tend to have limited protein yields, right? Because, you know, you don't have tons of bacteria that are optimized for making protein, um, making your, your protein of interest. You've, you've sort of removed it from the cell and, and sort of started making proteins on their own. Um, 
it yields, it, it, the other thing that really limits yields, right, is that you're restricted to very small volumes. And the reason you're restricted to very small volumes is not probably because you can't afford giant test tubes, but because you can't afford enough of the, of the reaction mix, because these systems tend to be very expensive. The partially purified systems are, are a little bit expensive, and the pure system is, is, you know, if you wanted to do anything but a 50 microliter protein production, is, is obscenely expensive. Good, and with that, I think we'll end. We've, we've gone through, um, just, just to recap quickly, we've gone through sort of the, the, the common issues, right? So, so, some sort of um, how to set up a, 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 a protein production system. We've, we've talked about um, plasmid vectors. We've talked about uh, inducible expression. We've talked about designing your protein production. And we've, we've started to talk about some troubleshooting issues that you might run into um, when you're doing protein production. Finally, we've, we've ended with, a, with an in vitro protein production strategy. Um, and that takes us through sort of, sort of all of the classical bits of, of molecular biology, uh, um, transcription, the problem, you know, setting up production of your protein by transcription, and, and then sort of issues with translation that you might have. Um, and what, we're, what we'll talk about next week are sort of some, some less um, common problems, and, and most of those have to do with protein folding. Um, these are really sort of harder nuts to crack, um, but, we'll, but we'll try and do that a bit more next week. Um, and then we'll move on to... to